Thanks to uh, <clears throat> thank you to Margaret and uh, and Ruby. I was delighted to. I've, I've known Margaret and Ruby for many years, but never got to meet them in person. So it was really exciting to finally get to meet them. Uh, and thanks to Soraya, she's been terrific to work with, and I'm just uh, delighted to be here and, and uh, looking forward to learning a lot from you guys over the next day. It's kind of unsightly to have that up here. <laughs> Um, what I'm going to present is some material from this uh, book I just finished, and um, it, it just briefly it uh, has three sections. The first section is uh, devoted to a discussion, a theoretical discussion about uh, collaborative practice and its relationship to the history of modernism, and. Uh, and the book really was provoked by the fact that after I'd finished conversation pieces, it seemed as if there was increasing interest in the arts and collaborative, participatory, collective art practice. Um, and it was a curious phenomenon to me, and I wanted to try to figure out why were there so many people working in this manner, what, the, what, what, what was the significance of this, both in terms of, um, I suppose in terms of art practice, but also maybe the broader political significance of the fact that especially a younger generation of artists over the last 10 or 15 years has increasingly turned to working in groups in one form or the other. And uh, the second uh, section, the other two sections of the book are, um, one section deals with, with collaborative projects in the context of rural spaces and, uh, and uh, specifically in relationship to the discourse of uh, uh, neoliberalism and uh, the politics of development and what are the relationships and the discontinuities between artistic practices and projects developed by NGOs. And then the final section deals with projects in urban spaces and deals with the relationship between artistic practice and urban renewal and urban regeneration, uh, those processes. And, and what I was trying in a way to do, and I think what I felt that was missing in a lot of the writing that's been done on collaborative work in the arts is um, actually uh, develop a deeper understanding of what's going on in collaborative practice. So much of the work that I was familiar with was, when it came to actually describing what an artist was doing, was incredibly schematic. It would be a few pages at the most, or a couple of paragraphs that would be effectively descriptive, and then uh, present some sort of programmatic theoretical uh, discussion and then they're off to another project. And I thought there really wasn't a, a kind of a, a, a parallel to the process of, of close reading in dealing with process-based work. And as a result, there's a certain impoverishment, I think, of the discourse of art history around process-based durational practice. So my other goal in the book was to try to get myself to sit down and really spend some time with some projects. And this one I'm going to present today is one in Central India is what, is what I kind of present as a little bit of a case study. So this is just a kind of a redacted version of a longer discussion in this book. And uh, it focuses on the work of a collaborative team in uh, Central India, what's called the Bastar region, which is... Um, where I was largely a, a tribal uh, and peasant community. And so now I'll kind of read this to you with little asides periodically, because I wanted to get through a lot of information. Um, and it's, uh, the, the project is centered in a village called Copaveda, and outside the town is, is called Kandagawan. So you'll hear some kind of um, place-specific terms. The town of uh, Kandagawan is located in Bastar district, Chhattisgarh, 225 kilometers south of Raipur. And Raipur is a small, very small city in central India. Bastar's economy is centered on farming and rice cultivation. And, and can you hear me okay? Is the volume okay? Okay. It's also home to a large Adivasi tribal population. The Adivasi are um, these are some quotes from some of the participants in this group. The Adivasi are India's indigenous people, and the name means original inhabitants in Sanskrit, and have lived here for uh, thousands of years. In many ways, uh, little has changed. Uh, village life still centers on the seasonal cycles of rice cultivation and the monsoon, the weekly market, and the rituals of the sacred grove. It's mostly, most Adivasi uh, religions are uh, variants of an animistic tradition that precedes Hinduism. 
and this is just some kind of establishing shots of the village. That's the sacred grove where they perform rituals, and those are some of the terracotta sculptures they use for um, ritual worship. Um, electricity and running water remain rare outside of the scattered towns in the area. In the past decade, however, the Adivasi and peasant communities of Bastar have begun to suffer from some of the most corrosive effects of modernization, even as they receive few of its benefits. The expansion of multinational timber and mining operations into central India has threatened not only the ec ecosystems on which tribal and peasant communities depend for survival, it has also destabilized long-established living and working patterns in the villages. I pray the government finds some minerals under your hut or fields has become a new Adivasi curse. Unemployment, eviction from the land, disruption of traditional farming patterns whoops, are all uh, increasingly common features of Adivasi life. Um, each equally damaging are attempts to erode or displace uh, Adivasi spiritual and cultural traditions uh, by groups such as the Rashtriya uh, Swayam Svak Sang, which is uh, the RSS, which is a branch of the BJP, that's the uh, Bharatiya Janata Party, which is a right-wing fundamentalist Hindu um, party that's fairly powerful in India now. The RSS and other right-wing Hindu fundamentalist groups seek to civilize their term, the Adivasi. They call them the Vanavasi, which means forest dweller, because they don't like the idea that they preceded Hinduism, so they kind of have to pastoralize them. Uh, this is occurring even as Adivasi craft practices, which were previously anchored in village rituals, are appropriated by Indian businessmen eager to adorn their Delhi and Mumbai boardrooms with tokens of the same native Indianness that their corporations are rapidly destroying. Adivasi villages are thus poised between the depredations of industrial capital and the fetishizing appetites of consumer culture. Scholar Dip Kapoor has analyzed the many ways in which NGOs, development agencies, political activists, and other groups have sought to make use of Adivasi culture and community life. Kapoor, who spent almost a decade working in Khan villages, that's a particular Adivasi tribe in Orissa, outlined the various permutations of this appropriative drive in his recent research. He examines the discourse of Gandhian environmentalists who cast Adivasi village life as a romanticized antidote to the instrumentalizing forces of modernity, Indian NGO and development workers who view the Adivasi as childlike primitives in need of modernization and technical know-how, and Naxalite resistance fighters for whom tribal communities are merely another cadre to be mobilized in their war against the Indian state. And this area is a center of Naxalite resistance. The Naxalites were a group of Maoists formed in the Naxalbari region in West Bengal about 30, 25, 30 years ago. They now control large areas of central India and are at war with the Indian state. Uh, and are anxious to um, recruit Adivasi tribal people and peasants into their cadres. Uh, there's a rural jungle guerrilla warfare center about uh, 20 minutes from this village. In each case, the, <coughs> excuse me, the conflicted uh, and hybrid nature of contemporary Adivasi life is neglected or overlooked. There are uh, relatively, relatively few attempts to engage with the specific situation of Adivasi communities here and now and the unique challenges that they face at the interstices of mod modernity and tradition. These questions of adaptation and survival, resistance and assimilation bring us back to Kandagawan and the outlying village of Copa Veda. Over the past decade, Mumbai artist Navdrat Altov and Kandagawan artists, uh, uh, and also Adivasi or peasant artists, Raj Kumar, and I'll show you some pictures as Raj Kumar, Shanti Bai, oh, that's Gisarum, Gisarum, that's Navjat, and there's Shanti Bai. Um, Shanti Bai have built a small independent art center in Copa Veda, uh, Dialogue, that was that sign I showed you. They created the center in order to develop projects with Adivasi and peasant communities in the area. They got some initial support from the IFA, that's the Indian Foundation for the Arts in Bangalore, but for the last, I don't know, a, seven or eight years, they've been entirely self-supporting. They sell their own sculptures and then use the profits generated by the sale of their sculptures to support the space. The center is named Dialogue, which reflects a key component of their creative philosophy. While their projects often take physical form, uh, usually spaces related to collective activities like children's play or water collection, they're equally concerned with the processes of reciprocal learning 
generated in the planning and creation of these spaces, as well as the forms of social interaction catalyzed by their subsequent use. And these are just some drawings in the village. They work with a lot with the kids in the village, as you'll see in a bit. A lot of times the drawings will feature like the first time one of the children has seen a car or a truck or a, a clock um, and herding animals and things like that. 